Hello to everyone, property bants and rants, and we're here to inspire and help the property industry, everyone involved in the property industry. And I'm very, very lucky today to have my special guest, Colin. I want to make sure I pronounce it right, Colin McClatchin. Is that right? I, I don't know. I don't think I pronounce it right. I, I say <laughs> Portland. I think you're supposed to say Portland, but it makes it similar. Like okay. My eyes. So. Fair, fair enough. Thank you, Colin. I appreciate that. I want to say to everyone, it's not often, this true, I, I'm very lucky I work with some amazing people, with some amazing people, and I train lots of people, and I'm involved in lots of different uh, events and sports and things like this. It's not often that you get in your lifetime to meet world-class people in business, and actually world-class, just lovely people as individuals. It's not often you get that in a lifetime. I'm glad to say, in Colin, you've got both. You've got someone who's, well, you'll hear his stories, it's amazing, world-class person, in business and also just a world class and a lovely, lovely person. So Colin, welcome and thank you for, for joining us today. And I think the listeners will get a lot out of this today. So just a bit of background about Colin. Colin spent about twenty five years uh in the S in the SAS, no no least, but also security type related uh matters. Um at a world class level. He's been involved in some of the most uh, most uh, I don't know, not not exciting is the wrong word, but most dangerous SAS missions in the most recent years. Uh, he's one of the few people that be involved in, in hostage negotiation and being a hostage himself. You probably recognize him from um, SAS, Who Dares Wins, being on TV, but he does lots of other things, and I'll ask you about that later on as well. Uh, so, Colin, uh, welcome. I think the listeners are going to get a lot, a lot of information from you that they can apply to their normal business uh, from the things that you're gonna, we're going to talk about. That's okay, Colin. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Colin. So, Colin, the first thing I want to ask you is I want to talk to you about, because agents, like every, every industry, actually find it really hard to get great people to work for them. Now, the SAS, they have to look for world-class people. So just, just so when we think we've got it tough and getting the right people for our, our job, explain to me how you got into where you were in the SAS and what that selection process is like and how they dwindled down and, and things like this. So just, just explain that to me, Colin. Yeah, I always think that Perspective is always really important in life because you have nothing to measure it to you, success, good day, bad day, I'm good at my job, I'm bad at my job. You have nothing to compare that to unless you have perspective. So I always, I always keep that. I've kept that through life. You know, anytime you think you're doing a good job, you're having a bad day, you've always got some kind of perspective to measure it against. And for me, when I was in the army, I thought I was a decent soldier. I, you know, I, I was, I was flying up the ranks. I was fit, you know, doing all the courses and stuff. But it was only when I came across the SES that I realised there was another level, another tier of mm-hmm. soldiers where being fit and a good soldier, being able to be dynamic, adaptable, was just that was your core skills. And then that was mm-hmm. my on, and so. That, that inspired me to put my put my papers in for selection without really knowing much about it because there wasn't anybody from my old unit that was in the SES. If you were from the powers of Marines, you probably had a good idea. We had nobody. And so there's one aspect to that that's that sort of fear of the unknown. You don't know what you let yourself in for. But I would always tell anybody that if you're thinking about something, you're making a leap, you're making a jump, you've got that, I don't know if I'm good enough, it's better to know than not to know, regardless of the income, regardless whether you make it or whether you don't. The knowing is better than the not knowing. And a lot of my friends come to me now and say, I wish I'd gave it a go. I wish I'd, I wish I'd tried selection. And regardless of whether they would have passed or failed, I think just knowing that they, they wish they would have tried it is better mm-hmm. than, than, than the alternative. So, I put my papers in, and like a lot of people, there's you maybe get about a thousand applicants through the military, um, and it's sort of the top tier of all the the, the, the the military. It's RAF, it's Army, it's Navy, it's territorials, um, and from a year and a half ago, it's women. So it's, it's the, the best of everybody we can find, and then they go through a series of sort of their own internal pre-selection, and then by the time selection comes, you've normally got about two hundred people. So there was 196 on my selection, and six months later there was 12, and so 12 wow. was passed and and got into the SES. So it's quite high numbers and quite a high dropout rate. Wow, that's and when we people in the property industry look at those numbers, a thousand applicants, 200 people get 
uh, narrowed down and then 12 people made it. So it's about 190 odd, doesn't it? But about 200 people. So that's an amazing numbers. And Colin, you were really young, weren't you? To get into the SAS, you actually, you're one of the youngest recruits they, they had, didn't they? Yeah, well, I was really young when I joined the army. So I was only 15 and my sort of choices in life, difficult background, childhood. So I was kind of lucky. The military saved me. It won't be for everybody, but for me, if I hadn't managed to get into the military, I don't know, you know, what my outcomes in life would have been. So I was fortunate. I got I got into the army. I was fifteen, and I, and you know, I by the time I was twenty three, which is quite young to be on selection, I re- I'd already been in the military eight years. You know, so although I was young, I was quite experienced for a young kid. I kind of grown up quick. So you're usually closer to thirty on selection. So I was really young, probably one of the youngest. Um, to get through SES selection, but um, you know it was a, it was a challenge for me, and it was just the next challenge in a in a in a set of challenges that I would set myself, like anybody does. Yeah, that's that's good. so, Colin. So one of the things I want to so ask: age is no, is not you know not an obstacle. It's really about mindset, isn't it, Colin? Colin, you, I don't know if you know this or, or what the the army say anything like this, but we always talk about in in property in any industry, just having A class players working for you. So SAS is kind of like the the elite and the you know A class players of the army. Is there a ratio? Do they say you know one SAS person you know will send them in what that what in these ten soldiers normally do? They have, do they have that type of comparable or not really? Is that something that doesn't really? Yeah, there's not really, there's not really a number in terms of a ratio. But what I would say is a small group of SAS can probably do what almost a brigade can do. And if we look at oh, well. We've had the yeah. SAS Broke Heroes series that's come out on television people might have seen. That was designed because we were getting beaten in the desert by Rommel. And so we needed a very small force that would take up a lot of resources from, from the Germans. So we could send in 20, 30 people in the Western Desert and they would cause havoc and they would they would draw, you know, thousands of troops, tens of thousands from, from the Germans mm. to try and do the, the sort of damage. And also the damage the SAS were doing. They, I think that the little group of guys in the Sassel Heroes took out more planes than the REA did. And so when you have that group and that amount of it, fact, and it's that amount of resources, it tells you what a powerful asset special forces their role can be. So you say a brigade. What's a, how, many, how many is in a brigade, Colin? What's yeah, so it's different now. Numbers have shrunk, but let's say a battalion. So let's say a, a company of, of guys might be 60 people. You might have sort of, I don't know, you might have 200, 300 people within a normal regiment. And then yeah. you'll have so many battalions within a division and so many divisions and brigade, you know, so it's, it's, oh, a, wow. it's, a, it's yeah, a gosh, people. Gosh, that, but. That's right. And I think we all look for A class people. And I think that's that's a lesson to us all is to get only A class players in. People are gonna make a massive difference because they're worth a brigade worth of normal people, you know, that's that's what it's like. So that's the same very much. So thanks, Colin. I appreciate that. And we've got some other questions to you. Colin, I want to ask you about imposter syndrome. So everyone suffers from a lack of confidence. I think probably about ninety six percent of people do. Everyone's got it. Big buzzword really at the moment. It's been around for years, but it's imposter syndrome. So you know, for, I'm sure people know, but people, you know, people feel they're not good enough. They've had the training, but then they're faced with a real life situation where they've actually got to, you know, confront and do what they're trained for. So I'm sure in your life, in the SAS, you must have come across that situation. Can you describe something like that and how you dealt with that, Colin, so it helps our listeners? Yeah, and, and I think imposter syndrome will become ever increasingly common and people because we're more mobile we're more used to moving around breaking out of relationships learning new skills moving from one industry to another so mm. that if we think about all the factors that make up imposter syndrome as well as all the acceptability about all the mental struggles we go through anyway i think imposter syndrome will become more and more common as as we progress in life because all these factors are for it. You know, it's quite common for us now to do one career for 10 years and suddenly move mm-hmm. to a different country and do a different, you know, job. And I think those things, they, they lend themselves to, to all the sort of foundations for imposter syndrome. And if we think about it, 
it's quite natural. It's quite a healthy thing sometimes because if we think we're not good enough to do a job, we're probably going to do our best attempts at getting the job right. Whereas if we think we can do anything, nothing's no problem. Well, that's quite a lackadaisical attitude to have. And we should always think, well, I'm not, I'm never the finished article. One of people know the SES's motto, who dares wins, but very few people know the ethos. And one of our ethos is the unrelenting pursuit of excellence. You're never going to get there. You're never going to be mm. perfect. You know, there is no one person that's perfect for any job. But what we have is we have a lot of things in our toolkit and some people will be better at some things than others. But so they'll never be the perfect person for the job. But as long as we can do the best versions of ourselves and, and give it a go, then that's always where we're going to be. So I think it's natural, but I think we should take encouragement from the fact that, you know, there, there's nobody that's going to be the perfect fit. So, you know, we're, we're, we're as good as anybody to try on, especially if we have the key skills, we have the right attitude, we're willing to learn. We're willing to learn from failure, you know, adopt new things. And I think we're on, we're on to a winner. That's absolutely right, Colin. Is that ever, can you describe a situation where you had that? Colin or yeah I think I think probably quite a few times where I thought I'm out I'm out my sort of level here you know and it's gave me confidence because we might talk about Stansted a bit later but I was I was really young at Stansted you know I was maybe only 24 by that time and I was the first guy in the scene first sniper on the ground and this is this is not just get airplane is it Colin it's not the uh yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, a proper hijacking coming in Stansted on UK shores and you think everybody else is going to do the management. You're just going to be this little pawn, you know, yeah. told what to do, do your little bit and you're part of a small cog. But when you're the first person on the scene, you've got to manage it, brief people, you're thinking, this isn't what, like, I, I didn't think I would be here. And that's happened to all of us at some stage. We've been taken, just dro dropped right into the deep end and it's sink or swim. And at the time, it petrifying. You know, you've got this in process. Mm -hmm. This isn't my job. I'm there's somebody who's going to do this job much better, and I don't want to mess this up. But actually, afterwards, you think, do you know what? But if that's if that's as bad as it gets, I can take in and thrown at me now. And that was one of your first. That was one of your first jobs, wasn't it? That was one of the yeah. things you got called yeah. out to. So it was literally, I was probably at the job about three months. And I've got the call yeah, wow. and, uh, you know, you think big, hardy, roughly tough, the SES guys. Well, you know, I think that fear of failure thing comes in. And I think no matter how big and strong you are, how well trained yeah. you are, everybody has a fear of failure because you don't want to let anybody down, particularly when there's yeah. a lot at stake. Yeah. And I realized that everybody has their own consequences to not doing a good job. But it's still relevant and it's still as powerful in your own mind that fear of failure regardless of what the consequences are so i always had that i had that fear of i just don't want to get this really wrong because that could mm. make or break my my career and i think that's normal it's it's an everyday thing that people have yeah so so that kind of leads us on to the next question really is, is what's what's the secret to success what did you apply in your own mind Colin, to think, well, this is how you know, so you've achieved a lot in your life. You know, what 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 principles do you apply to try to get on that route? Yeah, it's a really good question. I don't think there's any single answer for it. I think it's a culmination of things at different times. Um, so things like knowing that you will never be the finished article. You know, you're, you're always going to have a hope symbol because the deep time are you ever perfect to everything. So to accept that and to think, well. No matter what I'm doing, I'm just going to do the best I can do. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to learn from, from other people that are far better at doing the job than me. I'm willing to listen, learn, and I'm going to have the right attitude for everything I'm going to do. If I fail, that's okay because failure is normal, but I'm going to learn from failure so I never make that mistake again. And I'll, I'll just, I think those things, the resilience part, you know, just keep going, even when you think that, you're not going to get where you need to be. The ability to just bounce back a bit and say, you know what, I'll keep going with this because I'm I'm confident that eventually I'm going to get I'm going to get there. Yes, yeah, so I think resilience is really important, and one of the things that I know I know successful people is work really hard, uh, and they practice a lot. And I know you've you know the SAS uh, 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 have got some amazing stories about how they how rigorous they are in trying to practice and you know get involved in hostage situations. They need to practice a lot. And in property, that's our equivalent is role plays, you know, and people don't do that enough. But 
I mean, that that's part of your mission. That's part of the steps you take for every hostage situation. Is that right, Colin? Yeah, and I think that training as close to the real thing as possible will always help anybody in whatever sector they work in because when you are in the, the real environment, it's less of a shock. If you've been wishy-washy role-playing, let's just talk about a few things, well, that's nothing like the environment that you're in. So make mm. the, the training as close to the real thing as possible. I mean, I think about Stansted. We had the exact same aircraft to scale, size, make and model mm. in the hangar behind us. And we assaulted it over and over and over. We might have assaulted that a hundred times, but we tried lots of different things. We failed a lot, mm. we learned from it. And so by the time of the day of the races, we knew exactly what we had to do mm. because marginal gains are really important. Those seconds and marginal gains, those will be the same in, in, in any environment. Exactly. I mean, Colin, it, it, this is what Colin is saying is, is magic's gold. So it's a, it's having a, you can have a fear of failure. That's that's okay. But you just got to push on anyway. Colin's been talked about resilience. They just keeps pushing up, pushing on. It's like the famous uh, Rocky quote, isn't it? It's about how often you can you can get up, and you know we all need to learn in that. So we all need to apply that. And we you know we're scared lots of times to do role plays. We're scared to make those calls, but. The more role plays you do, and as Colin said, you, you know they were practicing outside of the, the actual mission. They were had a replica, and they were uh, and they were assaulting that. That's what we need to do in our, our businesses as well. Colin, one of the things that you you talk about, I think, is is really good. You talk about uh, you know having fear, but thinking about the long term consequences as well. And I think you, you've got a really good uh, little uh, story that you say about you know think about everything's got a consequence. Can you just explain that to me? Because I think that's absolutely true. Yeah, I think whenever I, whenever I've told stories in in the past, and um, I, I talk about stories within the SES that uh, you know they're not they're not a secret. You can go on Wikipedia and you'll find out about Operation Trent. But stories that are sort of they they typify what people assume is bravery. So you know, sort of eight guys skydiving out a, a C one thirty. Um, onto a target where there's over 100 fighters. And you think when it comes to those kind of numbers and those threats, surely it just comes down to bravery. And I can assure everyone, I, I've never been a brave person or fearless. I've always had fear, and I think fear is really healthy if you have fear, because you're not going to be rash, you're not going to make silly decisions that other people uh, and, and bother. I think you've got to have that healthy dose of fear. And I have it now. I have it when I do my public speaking, you know, you're always worried about once this goes wrong or say that you've always got that apprehension. And I think that's healthy. Well, I always say sometimes you've got difficult decisions to make or you've got to have a you've got to make a really difficult conversation. I always think just think about what the consequences are. What what happens if I do and what happens if I don't? And sometimes the consequences of that will will help you make the right decision. And sure. For me, the consequences have gone this way into the bullets are, well, are really short. I'll find out in the next few seconds how that's going to be. But the consequences of running that way, that's far longer. I'm going to take that with me for a long time, probably for the rest of my life. So sometimes when you have a difficult decision to make or you're going to have to be brave or, or be fearless and having a conversation with somebody you don't really want to have a conversation about, just think about the consequences. What happens if I just put this off and leave it? And what happens if I just address it? Because regardless of the consequences, you'll be glad you did it. Hundred percent. I love that. I love that. It's actually really good. And I think I've applied that already since um, since I've seen you. And I think that's absolutely true. And it's, it's just a matter of thinking. Look, you know, some things are hard in life sometimes, but it's invariably it's the hard things that are the things that really count in life. Because easy things, everyone can do them. You know, ninety percent of everyone's job, almost anyone could do it. But it's the nitty gritty, it's finding out what what you're really good at, and making sure that you do those things all the time is really what what gets you there. The other thing I want to speak to you about, Colin, is obviously you know we all feel like we're too busy, we all feel like we've got too much on. So, and prioritization is a big thing. So, obviously, obviously, when you're in the SAS, you've got to prioritize, and you're in one of those uh, zones. You know, how do you prioritize what comes first? What do you how do you apply that? What what do you do? Yeah, sometimes it's quite hard, but you have to remove a lot of the emotion from it and have just a system and trust the system, just control the controllables. And so people think, you know, it's hard to prioritize where between this and that, or how do I give my time up and stuff. But 
that's not difficult. Prioritizing is when you have 60 casualties, all with varying injuries, and you have one med pack. That's prioritizing. That's triage. That's who, who's getting this med kit. There's 20 targets coming, different ranges, different weapon systems. I've got one. What's my priority? Who am I going to take on first and why? And a lot of that comes down to a couple of things. Training, instinct, and probably the, probably the last thing is just trust in the process. This is the process. And if we trust it, we're, we've got a better chance of getting through it than if we don't. If we just go random, if we just go have a feel or, you know, that then we're going to get in trouble. But if we trust the process, nine times out of ten we'll be okay. Now, that applies in everything. That applies in sport. Now, I remember Tiger Woods saying he was one of the, he, he described himself as the 1%. He said, when I go up to a difficult shop and it's lodged in there, it's dug in, it's against a tree, it's on a lie, whatever it is, he goes, I'm, I'm the 1%. He said 99% of people will go up to that and they'll think about all the difficulties. What can go wrong? What happens if I miss at this? What are the things that are likely to be bad about this? He said, I'm the 1%. I think about a, a shot I hit that was like that and I hit it perfectly. I hit the perfect shot and I replay it over and over in my head and it's the last thing that's gone through my head when I take the shot. And he said, guess what? Nine times out of ten, it goes okay. He said, but... I can tell you, if I was doing the opposite and I was thinking about all the things that go wrong, guess what's going to happen when I take that shot? And I think there's a lot of truth in that. So I think, Connor, that's absolutely true. So, well, two things I took from that is, first of all, you know, you've got to trust your gut and you've got to also make sure that you've got positive thoughts in your head because, say, it's, it's, you get the same outcome. Uh, but, you know, I do sports at quite a high level and I know that, to get that, there's no point re recreating bad things in my head. It's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've got the same strength, I've got the same abilities, but just think positive, and invariably it works, it works out better. There's no, no, no harm in thinking positive. I think it's, it's a much better thing. Priority wise, you know, guys, we all think we got it hard when we've got to make decisions about business. Colin was having to make life and death decisions. That's those stories he say that really puts our jobs in perspective. So thanks, Colin. That's really good. Um, it comes down to though, Colin, ultimately. Trust in your gut, isn't it? And that comes down to, like you said, the better systems you've got in place, the more you've done, the more you practice, the more you can trust your gut, essentially. Yeah. So that's, that's the case, isn't it? Yeah. And I think if your training's been of a high standard and it's been relevant and real, and I, I think it gets closer and closer, they sort of merge. So when you're in the real environment, when I go into a, a firefight and it's in a built-up place, there's bodies running about, well, I'm used to that. You know, we mm. train with live rounds. A lot of the rest of the military train with blanks. It makes a different sound. You don't see Tracer flying by you. And I remember the very first time, I remember as I was coming into Sierra Leone, we're doing the hostage uh, rescue. And as, as, we're, as we're flying in, um, I, I remember all the, all the green uh, Tracer flying up. And I remember thinking, that's so cool, green Tracer. I've never seen green <laughs> Tracer. And then I can't remember it was enemy fire. And uh, the only people that use green I like, you know, the Chinese and Soviets and stuff. And I was thinking, oh my God, that's enemy fire flying. Oh, wow. And, and that split second took me back to, we don't train with green tracer. We train with red yeah. tracer. And so those, it kind of brought me back to the, to the moment where I was like, where this isn't training. This is, you know, we're, we're yeah. in the zone now. In the real thing, real thing. Um, Colin, I don't want to take too much of your time. I've got a couple of other. I've got one more question for the just for the listeners. Then I want to find out a little bit about what you're actually doing uh, now. So, what's the best thing? I ask all my all my guests this, Colin. What's the best thing that you own that costs less than hundred pounds, but actually you couldn't do without? What is that for you, Colin? Whoa, 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 whoa. well, there's a, there's a difference between there's a difference between the best thing that's probably cost me under hundred pounds and something that I couldn't do without. Um, probably the best the best thing that's under hundred pounds, I would say, is probably the Amazon Fire Stick. I, I take it with me everywhere. So I do a lot of traveling. So okay. I've got all my apps on there. I've got all my like. So if I'm staying overnight in a hotel, I can just plug it in. I can watch a movie or whatever. I've got it on there. So that's been a little. Um, that's been a little godsend for me. Could I do without it? Yeah, probably. You'd be surprised. <laughs> the SDS guy said he couldn't do without his Amazon Fire. <laughs> Something I can do without. I think is um, is purpose. It's far less yeah, than that. Yeah. 
uh, uh, you know, it, it didn't cost you anything purpose, it's free. But if we don't have purpose, a drive, ambition, something to aim for, a goal, we very quickly deteriorate. And I'll give you examples. People work their mm. whole life very diligent. They retire. They don't have a hobby. They don't have a part-time job. They don't have something, a sport. They don't have something they do. They don't have a social thing. Watch how quickly they deteriorate mm. because we're Should. human beings. We need a purpose. We need drive, ambition, a mission, a goal, an aim. We need it. Oh, gosh. Look at that. That's gold from Colin. Gold. I told you I told you guys would love Colin. So, Colin, tell me about you. What, are you. what are you up to at the moment? How can people see more of you? How can they get that? How can they get that from you, what, you got, what you're giving now? Yeah, so I'm, I, one of the things that I love about what I'm doing now is it's quite diverse. I'm doing lots of different things. So, as you know, doing the talks, doing the teamwork, leadership, workshops. Um, I just want to say, I, think I, 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 I see lots of speakers, but I, I say Colin is one of the best speakers I've ever seen. And I've been doing this sort of thing for about 30 years. And Colin literally, I say, is world class. He's so good. I saw him twice in 14 days to see the same talk he gave the first time. That's how good it was. And the second time was as good as the first time. So honestly, if you get a chance to see Colin, you got to see Colin. So you do that, Colin. That's well worth it. Go on. I, I, I appreciate that. I'm, all, I'm always learning. But um, I've, I've learned from some great people at workshops. You know, you never invent anything yourself. You can take bits from everybody else. Like mm. anybody that I am. Um, yeah, I do that. And then I do the motion capture for video games. So games like Grand Theft Auto Five. Red Dead Redemption, I play out at Morgan. Um, I do that stuff occasionally. Um, I do a lot of the Stoic events. So I do have a corporate team building company called Stoic Events. We have our own area, range, weapons, helicopters, speedboats, vehicles, and we take care of the day, the weekend. You just arrive, we'll take care of everything. We assign missions, split you into teams send you off you have to find out what happened to the missing agent there's code breakers you have to shoot things blow things up it's been a spine well yeah, what, what can and what does that do Colin? that and that's how you for businesses it's commercial event what what does that what do you think that brings to a, a business yeah well it depends we we don't have an off the shelf thing that we sell we tailor it around the company so if the company let's say for example the last one we did was a red change management so we had two different subunits they hadn't really worked together. They didn't know each other. So we put them in teams and forced them to work together. And the, the guys at the end of it said, in that one weekend, they probably did about six months of change management process. By the end of it, they knew each other. They knew their strengths and weaknesses. And they, were, they weren't afraid to mix it with each other. Whereas that can sometimes, when you bring two cultures together, can be quite a slow process. So change management is one piece. Teamwork's the obvious one for the other one. Resilience, problem solving, time management. We tailor make our checkpoints and challenges around the issues that the company has. So yeah, they're great fun. You know, we take care of food and accommodation, everything, but the real time problems. Yeah, so so really they're the things that affect every business. So really what you're doing is you're shortcutting I know you said six months, I think in my experience, it could be years and years. To, to even get to that point. And lots of times, you know, I'm sure if all listeners look at their own business, there's lots of time you've got people within your business that probably haven't had a proper chat with each other for years and years and don't really know each other. So can't fix that dynamic to make sure that they're delivering, you know, to the outside world, the type of service that we should be delivering to the outside world. So I think, Colin, I think that, you know, that is really something that's crucial for businesses. And, and I'm glad you're doing it. I'm glad you're doing it. It's, it's really, really good. Um, Colin, have you got a, a, a WhatsApp or anything like that, or you got a Twitter that people follow you on, or not really? What what the yeah? What so I'm available on a lot of different things. I've I've got my own uh, website, um, www.colin22sas.co.uk. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Colin McLaughlin22, and I'm on LinkedIn. You'll see me as Colin McLaughlin, um, and you'll see a guy a lot smarter dressed than me standing behind the podium. But um, yeah, available, available everywhere. And, and obviously people can get in touch through yourself, Tony. I'm happy to pass on details and stuff if they're in. Right, we'll try and put, we'll, we'll try and put with the details at the bottom of this, of this podcast as well. Colin, I, I say, I don't want to take up much of, more of your time. So thank you very much, Colin. I say, I think the listeners are going to get so much out of this. And I say, Colin is a great guy, also world-class speaker, world-class person. 
all round. So, guys, if you can use this, you can use the talents that he's got. Please use them. Colin, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate your time. Thank you.